Thomas, who was partially blind, walked into Hope Church on a Sunday afternoon. Visitors often walked in off the street at Hope Church. During this special time at Hope, Pastor Hill was teaching on miracles. As Pastor Hill ended his teaching, he made the call for salvation, and Thomas walked to the front of the church. The pastor asked him his name as he was a visitor. He said, My name is Thomas. I need food to feed my daughters. My wife died, and we are having a hard time. Pastor Hill responded, We have a food kitchen that will help you with food. Is there anything else we can do for you? He asked. Thomas responded, Just pray for me. Since Pastor Hill had been teaching on miracles, he prayed to God for a miracle on Thomas's behalf. The congregation had been seeing them manifest in their own lives. Their faith was activated to believe God for miracles. Pastor Hill prayed specifically for Thomas's eyes. Father, we know you are a miracle worker. You have restored sight to the blind and that nothing is impossible for you. God, we believe that Thomas's eyes are healed. We believe by faith that when he opens his eyes that he will be able to see. When the pastor finished praying, the man opened his eyes. He began to cry and blink several times. Thomas said his eyes did not burn and he could see. The congregation, the pastor, and man all rejoiced because God had performed a miracle. In today's lesson, believers testify that faith in God's Word produces healing. Can you recall your faith in God's Word producing healing in your life and others? Good morning and God bless all of you, those who are tuning in by way of Facebook and YouTube, as well as those of you who are in the chilly sanctuary this morning. We, we greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, it is a wonderful day, a day that the Lord has made. We're here to, um, to review and teach Sunday school this morning, and I believe that God has some messages and a lesson for us in store uh, as we move forward with our Sunday school teaching. Um, so those of you at home, just to um, let you know, we are going to be studying from the gospel, out of the gospel of John, specifically chapters 46, I'm sorry, the gospel of John chapter 4, the gospel of John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. Again, John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54 is where we're going to be studying today. And um, that's where we'll be. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Father, we come right now in the name of Jesus and we give you glory. We honor you for being the God of another day, another chance, the God of our salvation. Lord, we quiet ourselves just for this moment to let you know that we thank you and we give you holy honor for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for your protection, for your covering. We thank you most of all for saving us and making us righteous in your sight so that we can approach you boldly. We thank you, Father, for Jesus that has secured our salvation, that when we pray to you, you see us and you hear us through the blood-stained banner of the cross and what Jesus did for us. And so, Father, we ask that as we come into this place that your Holy Spirit, which we believe is already here, will teach us all of your truths, will instruct and guide us, and will give us what we need to move forward this week. Bless us now, Lord. Open up our hearts and our minds of understanding. Allow your word to be deposited in us. We pray, as we always do, that you allow our flesh to decrease, but your spirit in us to increase. God, we need you this day. We need you in our life, in our communities, in our homes, on our jobs. And we ask, Father, that you would give us the strength that we need to make it day by day. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. The... Lesson again is coming from 
the Gospel of John, chapter 4, beginning in verse number 46. And it's a short, it's a short reading, so let us go ahead and start the reading. Again, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, beginning in verse number 46. Uh, here's what the Word of God says. So Jesus came again unto Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto them and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The noble man said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house and again, the second miracle that Jesus, I'm sorry, this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea in Galilee. The title of our lesson today is The Word That Heals. The Word That Heals. Our keep in mind verse um, comes to us from John chapter 4 and verse 53. And it simply says this. So the father knew that it was at that same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. Amen? Our keep in mind, or our, our not keep in mind, I'm sorry, our focus story for those of you who saw the video who are watching from home, uh, those of you who are watching online, it dealt with a man named Thomas who was partially blind, who walked into a church, the name of the church was Hope, on uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, visitors were able to walk in out, off the street, and the pastor who was teaching at the time um, was in the process of teaching, and they were praying in this season for God's miracles basically to manifest. They certainly had a full kitchen, and they were asking the young man that came in, I think his name was Thomas, what did he need it? And he wanted them to pray for him, and, you know, he certainly needed food and clothing for him and his family. Um, but the pastor specifically prayed for this man's eyesight because in one of his eyes he was actually blind. And um, after the prayer, the man's sight was restored. If the church, my humble opinion, is to be the church, we have to first of all begin to believe and understand that everything Jesus said that we could do, that that power is still available to us right now. That it is not a power that was contained in the text of our Bible but it's active power that we can walk in right now. Oftentimes in church, in preaching, and even sometimes in our teaching, it becomes sometimes too theoretical. It becomes that's what they did instead of what we are able to do. And when I say what we are able to do, I'm not talking about in our own power and in our own might, but I'm talking very specifically what God is able to do through us by way of the Holy Ghost. There is something about our ability to believe God in spite of what things look like that it gives God room to work in our life. Let's go here to the text. It's a very short text. It's a very... Um, 
straightforward text, but I do want to give you a background. So, I don't know, yeah, okay, yeah. So those of you who were with us last time went to Jerusalem, I know I'm always referencing it because we're having a meeting today about going back to Israel. But when we, when we were there around the Sea of Galilee, we also went to Cana. We went to Cana where Jesus performed this miracle of turning water into wine. And as we were in Cana, those of you who remember, Cana is about 15 or 16 miles, God bless you, 15 or 16 miles just north of the Galatian Sea. They call it the sea, but it's really a lake because it's surrounded by um, mountains and uh, it trickles or flows out down through Jerusalem all the way down to the Dead Sea. So the start of the um, Jordan River, the start of the Jordan River actually comes out of uh, the Galatian Sea, all right? That's where it comes out of, and then it flows south from there. So, so uh, Gal, um, the Sea of um, Gal Galatia and, um, I'm sorry, the Sea of um, Galilee, I keep saying Galatia, I'm so sorry. The Sea of Galilee is north, that whole region is north of Jerusalem. So, so if, I, if I, I wish I had maps and screens up right now. So you have uh, Galilee north, then you'll have Jerusalem just south of that, and then south of that you'll have the Dead Sea. And that's how uh, the Jordan River flows. The Jordan River flows from the Sea of Galilee down through um, uh, Jerusalem and then down also ultimately into the Dead Sea. And so Capernaum, which is also mentioned, Capernaum is one of the little communities right around the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so it's one of the little communities right around the Sea of Galilee, and Capernaum was the headquarters uh, where Jesus really did most of his ministries. When you look at all of the ministries of Jesus Christ, over three quarters of everything he did was contained right around the Sea of Galilee. Most of the stuff that he did was contained right there in the Sea of Galilee region. And so the Bible gives us this story this morning about this gentleman who is literally, um, and they call him a nobleman. Um, let me go straight to the, uh, uh, to the scripture, we go, we go verse by verse. John, John says, so Jesus came again unto Cana of Galilee. So Jesus left Capernaum and went up to Cana of Galilee. Let me give you some background on that because he took the long way. So Jesus has already met with the woman at the well because he spent some time in Samaria before he went back up to Cana of Galilee. So he spent some time with the woman at the well, which is not in our story today. Um, and then he goes back up to Cana of Galilee, where he uh, turned water into wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick. Now, who is this nobleman is the question, right? Who is this nobleman and why is his son sick? Well, we're never told why his son is sick. But the phrase that they give this man as a nobleman means that somehow he was connected to the local government. He was connected somehow to some of the rulers that were in that land in that day. Okay, that's, that's what he did as his job. Yes, sir? He, yeah, he was, so he was in service to one of the government officials. Yeah, we don't know exactly what's government, we guess, but we don't know exactly which government official, but he was in service. It was almost as if he worked for the city. Oh, he worked for the state, if we could put it that way. He had a good government job. How about that? He had a good government job with benefits. This was a, this was a noble man who had a good government job with benefits. The title noble does not necessarily denote his character, although it seems that his character was good, but it denotes his position in his work. Okay, so he, um, he left, now here's what's interesting. This guy left Capernaum to go and meet Jesus. Why is that interesting? It's interesting because when I look at the text, there are certain movements in this text that really grabs my attention. First of all, when you understand where Cana is from Capernaum, 
you have to understand that there was no street cars back then. There were no there were no Ubers back then, no taxi cabs back then. There were there were no buses back then. So if you're going to go from Capernaum all the way up to Cana, you're either going to have to go by donkey or horseback or you're going to have to walk. It's believed that this man walked 15 miles to go from Capernaum up to Cana just to get Jesus to come and see about his son, which lets me know, and I think this is the first, this is the first lesson in our text today, that you have to do whatever you need to do to get Jesus' attention. There are sometimes you got to do whatever you need to do to get in Jesus' presence. What do I mean about getting Jesus' presence and get, and get his attention? There are times when life and the problems of life become so great upon you, you might have to leave your comfort zone. You might have to leave where you are. You might have to shut everybody else off in order for you to get everything that you need in order for Jesus to be able to heal you, in order for Jesus to be able to take care of you like you know Jesus could. And so this man put in his mind that his son was sick. And there is nothing more that challenges a parent than have a, having a child that is sick. If you want to see a parent worry, uh, let that child get sick, especially to the point of death. You would do whatever you need to do in your power to save your child. And what's interesting about that, excuse me, I did not mean to come here with gum in my mouth, but I did, I'm sorry. And you would do everything within your power to make sure that you exhausted all of the resources that you have. I'll never forget a friend of mine, she goes here, she's a trustee, uh, uh, Sister Stacy Poe. I remember when her daughter was taken down to Children's Hospital. Adovi, I think at that time, was only about six or eight. She's taken down to Children's Hospital. She called us down to the hospital because the doctor said that they didn't know what was going on with her while she was having these headaches. They sent her home and then she came back. Well, the second time she came back, they did an MRI or one of those other tests that they do, one of those scans, and they saw that she had brain cancer. Here's what was interesting. The doctors at Children's Hospital, one of the best children's hospitals in the world, said there's nothing we can do. She probably has six months to live. Nothing left to do. She has six months to live. We were there when the doctors delivered the news. All of us felt hopeless. We began to pray and ask God to heal and show a way. Stacy began to get on the phone and start calling specialists all over the country. She had a book, I don't even know where she got the book from, but she started calling people all over the country. And as she began to call, she ran into Jude Hospital out of Memphis, Tennessee, who said, you know what? Send us her file. Her file was immediately sent down to Jude. They looked at her condition, Adovia's condition. They said, come on down. We'll take care of you, we'll put you up. You don't have to pay a dime for anything, come on down. They left Detroit, went down to St. Jude Hospital, stayed there, I think for a little over a year, until Adovia was healed by the medicine and the doctors, and as knowledge had increased, that they gave the doctors and the, uh, the, doctors and the people who were working on her that her body is healed. Adovia is now, I don't know if she's 30 yet, but almost 30, if she's not 30, 30 years of age, cancer-free, because her mama did whatever she needed to do in order to get healing for her daughter. The first lesson in this text, if you don't get nothing else, those of you who are watching at home, is that when you really want Jesus, when you really want a breakthrough, you do whatever you got to do. You move whatever mountains you have to move. You go to whatever depth you have to go to. You go to whatever changes you got to go through to make sure that you get in front of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus will give you an answer. And sometimes the bigger the miracle that you need, the bigger the breakthrough that you need, the more things that he'll have you go through and move out of the way in order that he can deal with you directly. She went beyond just our prayers at the hospital and said that God has an answer. 
I believe that's the reason some of us can't get the breakthrough that we need or the answers that we believe we deserve is because we're comfortable in doing the same thing the same way and yet expecting the same different results. And God is saying, how bad do you really want it? As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, watch this in verse 47. In verse 47, it says that when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down to his son. He was ready to tell Jesus what Jesus needed to do in order for his son to be healed. Jesus, I need you to come to my house so my son can be healed. Now, before we dog this noble man out, this ruler out, understand this, that prior to this healing, every healing that Jesus did or every miracle that he did prior to this, Jesus was on site. And because Jesus was on site, this noble man believed that Jesus had to be there in order for the miracle to take place. That gives me lesson number two. Don't put Jesus in a box as it relates to how he's going to operate. And sometimes we can get comfortable with the rhythm and with the order of how we do what we do that we expect Jesus to work within our system instead of us asking him, what do you have me to do? That's why on the bulletin, I like it that we have an order of service because God is a God of order. But I also like it when the Holy Spirit comes in and messes up the order that's on the bulletin and say, we're going to do it this way today. You can never get so comfortable. You can never get so familiar with God that you think that this is exactly how God is going to do it. God can bless you in many different ways. One songwriter say, it may not come when you want him to come, but when he does come, he's always on time. God comes in different ways. We have in our thought process, because he did it this way yesterday, is how he's going to act for us tomorrow. And that might not necessarily be the case. So here's, here's our job. Our job is to be open to the move of God However, he chooses to move. Y'all heard the story, right, of a man who was caught up in the flood. And as this man was caught up in the flood, he was on the roof of his house because the waters had now raised that high. And he was on the roof asking God to please save me. And then somebody came by in a boat and, and, and they said, come on, man, get on the boat. He said, no, I'm waiting for God to save me. And then a helicopter came and dropped down a lifeline in the basket for him to drop to him to get in the basket so they can rescue him off the roof. He said, no, I'm waiting for God to come save me. Can I say this? God will give us an exit strategy out of the conditions that we're in that sometimes is non-conventional. But you got to know it's God doing the work. Why? Because you prayed and asked him, Lord, how can I make this thing anew with me? Or how can I get my breakthrough? Or Lord, come in and change my condition or my situation. And when God gives you the opportunity to change your condition or your situation, and maybe I'm preaching to myself right now, you have to take it no matter how bad it looks no matter how unconventional it seems this man walked uphill 15 miles to get to Jesus because his son was near death he walked there look at verse 48 Jesus didn't seem impressed about the fact that he walked up there to see him I like Jesus Watch this. Then said Jesus unto him, except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. Now, here's what's important to understand in that verse. In that particular verse right there, here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus is talking not just to the man. Because if he was talking just to the man, he would have said, if you 
he would have said, you are looking for signs and wonders. But he's talking to the crowd. Because again, this is the place where Jesus turned water into wine. And if you see one good miracle, what you want to do? You want to see another one. The first one could have been a fluke. <laughs> the first one could have been somebody just messing with some stuff behind the stage. But so you want to see another one. And Jesus is saying here that you're looking for signs and wonders, but you're not concerned with a relationship. And sometimes we're more concerned with God doing stuff our way, like we always say, like a, like a little spiritual Santa Claus, right? And then really that term is an oxymoron term because there is no such thing. You know, kids here right now. There's no, there's no such thing as Santa Claus. And so God is not the God. God is not the God that, that, that turns stuff around for us just because we asked it just then. Because there are some times that God wants us to go through what we go through in order to make us strong. Jesus said, y'all looking for signs and wonders. But I like this noble man's faith. He says, okay, fine, preach whatever you want to preach, scold me however you want to scold me. All I know is this, my son is sick and I need you to come check my son out. Look at what he said. Look what the man says in verse 49. The normal man said to him, sir, uh, come down uh, or my child die or unless my child would die. He said, okay, fine, talk all that signs and wonder stuff you want to talk. What I'm saying to you is that there's a condition. What I'm saying to you is that there is a need for you to come down or my son going to die. You can call me whatever you want to call me. You can label me however you want to label me. You can group me in however you want to group me in. But all I'm saying is, I know this if I don't know nothing else, I need you to change my predicament. And that's where we ought to be with Christ in our life. That he is able to change our circumstances, that he's able to change. Now, this guy's son was near death. He don't get too much worse than that. He was near death. So this man was singularly focused. He said, I don't care what you're saying, but just come on down. Again, and he says that not because he doesn't believe Jesus, but he says that because he assumed that that was the pattern of Jesus. Be careful when you think you got him, God, Christ, figured out. Because just the moment you think you got him figured out is the moment that he can switch up on you. Amen? Jesus said unto him, watch, in verse 50, Jesus said unto him, go thy way, thy son liveth. Go thy way, thy, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. Now, here's what's interesting. Jesus didn't pray. Jesus didn't call a council. He didn't call a bunch of folk around. He says, your son liveth. Go thy way. Watch. He gave the word, the same word, that we read in our Bibles. How do I get heaven, here's, here's, here's the question, how do I get heaven to work on my behalf? By using the word of God. It's the same, watch, watch this. We live in a different time, but we live in the same world. We are a different culture than what was in biblical times from a timeliness standpoint, but we still have the same stuff. Illnesses have changed, but we still have sick folk around us. Problems still come and manifest, but there are different types of problems. But the one thing that is constant, the one thing that remains is God's word. Here's what I'm convinced of and here's what I know. That every problem we encounter, 
that everything that comes our way, there's a word in scripture that will address it for us and that will guide us on how to get through it. What it takes is listening and then obedience. Because you can hear and not be obedient. Come here, rich young ruler. You went up to Jesus and you called him a good master. And you said that you follow all of the law and you kept the law from the birth on up. And Jesus said, mm, that's cool, that's straight. Here's what I need you to do. I need you to go sell everything, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. The Bible says that he went away sorrowfully. Why? Because he wasn't willing to depart with his stuff. So we can listen, but yet we don't necessarily obey what God says do. This noble man knew that if Jesus said it, that establishes it, and I'm good for it. And it also brings to point simply this too. No matter when God wants to work in our lives, he requires us to do something. They referenced the first miracle when Jesus turned water into wine. What did they have to do in order for that miracle to actualize, to come to pass? They first of all had to go get the pots, and the pots were not little like pitchers that we carry Kool-Aid in. They were, this, they were these like 30 inch pots that were heavy, that was made out of you know, concrete. They had to pick them up and carry them to the well. Because they, they ain't take it to the faucet in the house because they have faucets in the house. So they had to take these things, go fill it up. So you had to lower the bucket down in the well, bring it up, dump the water in, lower it up, do that several times, watch, and then take heavy pots that are now filled with water, seven of them, back to the house. So they had to work in order for Jesus to see their faith and their belief. And then as they brought the water, as they brought the pots to him, he says, now dip. And as they dipped, the water became wine. What am I trying to say? There are times in our life that we land on our back waiting for a miracle. There are times in our life we're twiddling our thumbs waiting for a miracle. There are times in our life we're waiting for somebody else to do for us what we can do for ourselves. And Jesus is saying to us, there are some requirements that you have to do in order for a miracle to come in your life. All right, come here. Come here, uh, the 10 lepers. Uh, you had saw Jesus on your way. And as you saw Jesus on your way, you yelled out to him unclean, as you were supposed to do by the custom of the day. And as you yelled out to him unclean, he says unto you, uh, be thou clean. And then after you're clean, go show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says that as they begin to walk away from Jesus, because they begin to follow what he said, their bodies began to be cleansed. When we want God to do something in our life, it requires us to act a way that will allow the miracle to have room to take root in our life. This man's miracle began to take root the moment he began to walk away from Jesus, but walk back toward the problem. Mm, somebody didn't hear that. This guy's miracle began when he walked away from Jesus and walked back toward his problem. There are times when we leave church and we leave what we call the presence of God and we have to go back to our problems. But when we go back to our problems after we leave the sanctuary or the fellowship of the saints, we ought to leave with a little bit more faith. We ought to leave with a little bit more hope. We ought to leave here with a little bit more understanding that God is able to take care of whatever we need. This man understood that I was in his presence and this is what he told me to do. And what he told me to do was good enough for me. He didn't have to go on email and check it out with his best friends. He didn't have to get on the phone and call somebody up and say, does this sound right to you? He didn't have to do any of that. Jesus said it and that settles it for him. He goes back. Verse 49 says, and the noble man said, I'm sorry, verse 51 says, and as he was now going down, as he was headed back 
down that 15 mile journey. Can you think about that for a minute? Stop, stop for a minute. This man walked 15 miles, saw Jesus, and almost turned right back around. What you don't get in here is that there's, a, there's an exchange of a day. That there's a day that all of this took place, like a 24 hour period. But he walks all the way up there. The best he gets from Jesus is going back home, he all right. Now here's what's interesting. Has this ever occurred before? Well, let me, let me, first of all, let me, let me ask the question a little bit better, better. Do we know in scripture when someone was seeking to be healed before and the prophet wouldn't come to them, but they sent a message to them for, them for what they needed to do to be healed? Huh? Oh, look at you. Amen. Uh, Nathan, Nathan, the, the satyrian soldier in the Old Testament, he went to see Elijah and wanted to be healed of his leprosy. And when he went to see Elijah to be healed of his leprosy, Elijah didn't come out of his house. What Elijah did is that he sent his servant and his servant went out to tell him, he, he, he was the interesting part, uh, Elijah said he busy. Okay, this is my this is my commentary. Okay, let me just do my commentary. Elijah said he busy. He working on his sermon. He really don't have time to see you. He saw one leper case. He seen them all. Ain't nothing special about your leprosy. I know you big time man, but ain't nothing special. What you need to go do is go dip seven times in the Jordan River and you straight. And it's, and the Bible says that Naaman left upset. Because Elijah wouldn't come out to see him. In other words, he didn't give me my propers. That's what we used to say when we were growing up as a kid. You show me my propers. Now they say, you dissing me or you disrespecting me. He didn't show him his propers. So he was about to go back full of leprosy until his servant says, wait a minute. If the prophet would have told you to do some great feat, like to go kill a thousand men, you would have did it. If he told you to go uh, tie up 10 fox tails, you would have did it. All he said was go, go dip seven times in the Jordan River. And then Naaman's mouth was filled with arguments. He said, well, how come I can't go to a better river than the Jordan River? It's much cleaner rivers than the Jordan River. He said, wait a minute, if you want to get healed. See, lepers, lepers cannot be choosy. And at some point, all of us, are lepers in our life. What do you mean by that? There are times when problems that we need to be changed is so great that we have to follow whatever God is telling us to do. And our failure to do that, it hinders our ability to get the answer and the healing that we need. He went his way, and as he was going down the hill, leaving Jesus, going back toward the problem, guess what? Because of his faith, if I, if I was writing this, I would have a parenthesis in here. It says, because of his faith, <laughs> his servants met him and told him, saying, thy son liveth. What would happen if you leave here today and the very thing that had been worrying you the most you got home and received the email or received something that says that thing has now been changed because of your faith. You say, thank you, Jesus. God still answers prayer. Can, well, can I say this? God has already answered our prayers. The issue is, can we wait and be patient and tarry until it manifests? Because sometimes the answer is slow to come. Other times, it comes quite rapidly, like this guy. It came, the answer came quite rapidly. Now, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Watch. Then inquired of them the hour he began to heal, or amend. That's what amend means, the hour he began to get better. And they said unto him, Yesterday, around the seventh hour. Now, this is where this is where the precepts for ministry books differ with the other books. The precepts for ministry books say it was about two o'clock in the afternoon. The other books say it was about one o'clock in the afternoon. Nonetheless, what happened was his son began to be healed the moment Jesus was talking to this nobleman and told him that thy son liveth. 
when God speaks a word and he has spoken a word, it comes to pass. John, in, in the Gospel of John, he records something that leads Jesus to the cross more rapidly than anything else, and that was the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But before Jesus got there, he literally delayed his trip several days before he got to Lazarus. Word had gotten to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. Word had even gotten to Jesus that Lazarus has died, but Jesus says, no, Lazarus is just sleeping. But he was actually dead according to how we know someone died. He was dead for four days, which was, which was unusual because in Jewish custom, it was believed that the spirit hovered around the body for at least three days. So if you got up from the dead within a three-day period, it, I'm not going to say it was normal, but they had seen it before. But after the fourth day, there was no hope for you to be resurrected. Jesus gets back to Bethany to Mary and Martha's house. And then he's met with angry sisters who said, if you would have been here, if you just would have came when I asked you to come, our brother would not have died. Jesus looks them square in the face and said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. In other words, when Jesus said, I am the answer. For whatever is going wrong in your life, I am the he, then he says, and as he begins to look at the mourners, because some of them were fake mourners, but as he begins to look at the mourners who were around Martha and Mary mourning the death of Lazarus, he says, well, just take me to where you've laid Lazarus down. Take me to where you've laid his body. And as they take him to the, group, to the tomb, it's interesting that Jesus prays on the behalf of those who were there in order that they may strength, be strengthened in their belief. He didn't pray, Father, if you could do it. But he says, in order to strengthen their faith. And then he calls Lazarus to come forth. And the same condition that he was in in the tomb is the same condition he comes out in. And then they're told to loose him from the, from the grave clothes and set him free. What am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to get all of us to understand is that God does not have one certain way that he delivers, that he answers prayer. Our job is simply this, to seek him and to be obedient and to be faithful and to be diligent in watching God work. We gotta do what we have to do. And after we do what we have to do, God then ushers in the miracle and he does the rest. Yeah, they had, they, had, they, had, they had to remove the rock, absolutely. They had to remove the rock of Lazarus' grave because they put the rock there so that the stench from those who were in the grave, in that cave, would not come out. So that, yeah, they had to remove the rock and then he called them forth, absolutely, yeah. So look, go back to the lesson now, back here at the lesson. Look at verse, as he went down, and he says, verse 52, verse 52, John chapter 4, verse 52, he says here now, he says, then inquired of them the hour, oh, I just read that, verse 53, so the father knew that it was the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, thy son liveth, and he himself believed and his whole house. Not the first time we saw that language either. Because if you remember, when Paul and Silas was in prison, and it was at the midnight hour, they began to pray, and they began to sing, and then the, literally the foundations of the prison were shaken, and their chains fell off, and they began to leave, and the, and the, and the jailer came to them, and he was scared, and, he, and the jailer fell down, and he was saved, and his whole household was saved as a result of a movement of God. Here's what you don't know. You don't know who's watching what you're going through and how you're going through it. You don't know who is watching to see if your faith in action is the same as your faith in confession. Because I can confess faith all I want to. 
but can I show faith in the midst of going through difficult situations? Some folk watch us more than we know to see how are they going to handle this? Why? Because our testimony begins to show when we say, I'll wait until he blesses me, like the three Hebrew boys did. Even if he don't deliver me from the fire, I ain't going to bow down to you, Nebuchadnezzar. It's our faith that helps attract other people to God. Now, what happens with somebody, when we're going through our problems, we're going through whatever issues that we're going through, and we're crying just like the world, the world. We're, we're worrying just like the world. We're, we're upset and befuddled just like the world. Not believing that God is able. What's the difference? Well, there is no difference. And so people, you know, like, well, if your prayers ain't answered, <laughs> and if you and if you complain and just like I complain, why you go to church? Just hang out with me on Sundays or Saturday nights. But our response has to be different. Our response have to believe, has to be that we believe and then we follow through with our belief. No matter how difficult the test, no matter how you, even when you don't know how God is going to, to deliver, you act as if he's going to. Even if, even if it's not according to your timing, you know that his timing is better than yours. It says here, verse 54 again, it is again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he had come out into Galilee. Now, this is technically not true because technically, again, he had, he had, um, he had done some other miracles, but not in Galilee, not up in, um, in Cana. So they're, they're very specifically talking about what happened up in Cana, all right, because when he was down in in Galilee, again, he was traveling back and forth from Cana to Galilee and some of the other surrounding cities. He had done some more miracles, but is basically talking about what he did up in Cana, in Galilee. And he had spoke the word in Cana. Now, there was another noble man, I don't know if you remember it. There was another noble man by the name of J uh, Jairus. Anybody remember Jairus' story? This is not Jairus. Jairus was another noble man and Jesus was making his way to Jairus' house because his daughter was sick unto death. And that's when the lady with the issue of blood bust through the crowd, touched the hem of his garment, and all of her blood diseases were healed. And Jesus says to the crowd, someone touch me. And the disciples looked at Jesus and said, Jerome's commentary, man, you tripping. Of course people touch you. There's a whole bunch of folk out here. People bumping up to you all the time. He says, no, somebody touched me by faith. And he looked at her, and, and as he saw, he says, thy faith hath made thee whole. And then he continued on to Jairus' house where he raised his daughter, where he raised Jairus' daughter unto death. So these are two different instances where Jesus goes in and he heals a child from death or raises a child from death. And he does it, watch this, he does it differently in both instances. Again, it furthers the point that he doesn't always have to do it exactly like you think he should do it. What we need to be is just faithful that he's able to do it. Yeah, he told me, he said, just say the word and he'll be healed. Exactly, you're absolutely, there's another servant. He said, all you gotta do, another soldier, all you gotta do is just say the word and he'll be healed. And that is the type of faith demonstration walk that we have to have. I just truly believe it. That if I'm asking God for a breakthrough, maybe it's a better job, maybe it's, maybe it's better work conditions, maybe it's a better house or a car, or, or maybe it's a clearing of my mind, or maybe it's starting a business, or maybe it's you know, insight into something else. Whatever it is, I'm asking Christ for it. I'm doing what I need to do to prepare for it, and then as I do what I need to do to prepare for it, guess what? He begins to work that thing out for us. 
How disappointing would it be, let me ask you this, <laughs> how disappointing would it be for God to give you a miracle and you couldn't process it? For God to give you a job that you've always wanted and you wouldn't go to the job? For God to give you the approval for the new house and yet you won't go to the closing to sign the papers? <laughs> For God to tell you that your son or your daughter is healed, but you won't go to the hospital to pick him up. Because you haven't believed. And our job is to always know that God's word is true and that his promises are still always yes and amen toward us. So here's, I think, the takeaway lesson for us. Don't be religious. And what I mean by religious, don't be ritualistic in expecting God to do what he does for us. But when you want deep stuff, you gotta go deep in him. You gotta press differently in him. It took significant effort for this noble man to get to Christ. It took significant faith for him to, for Jesus to say, I ain't going, but your son gonna live. And the man not argue with Christ, but go back down the hill to get the word that his son liveth now. So be able to do the difficult things and then be able to follow through as if what Jesus said is true. Mama, <laughs> I used to, you know, because, you know, I, I, don't think I, I don't think I purposely tried mama when I was little. Not on purpose. I didn't, I didn't make up my mind. I said, I'm going to try her and see if it's true. I just didn't do when she told me to do some things. But I just like, I ain't doing that. I ain't feel like it. I'm playing. I'm doing something. I got some, I'm watching my favorite show. I'm watching Lost in Space. I don't feel like doing it right now. I ain't doing it. I'll get to it when I get to it. That was my thinking in my head. But of course, I would never say that out loud. Because if I said it out loud, y'all wouldn't have a pastor named Jerome Warfield right now. Y'all would, y'all would be, have somebody else. And so I would never say it out loud. But that would be my thinking, right? And yet, it wasn't in until she had told me to do something more than once. And she said, okay, I ain't gonna tell you no more. And when she said, I ain't gonna tell you no more, I knew that was the indication for me to get off of my bombosity and do what she said do, or less I'm gonna get the result of her not telling me no more. There are some times when God says to us, I ain't telling you no more. Just do it. Just do whatever I'm instructing you to do. I don't care if it's un I don't care what people say. I don't care how they talk about you. But do whatever I'm instructing you to do. I'm trying to save your life. I'm trying to bring blessings to your life. And you up here worrying about what other folk think. He wasn't worried about what other people thought. He wasn't worried about how come Jesus ain't come back down the mountain with you. He wasn't worrying about how it looked. He just did it and obeyed. And as he obeyed, his son was healed. That's our challenge in this, in this peer pressure world. Our challenge is to obey even when it looks crazy to do what Christ tells us to do. Because it was unheard of at that time for Christ to speak the miracle and it was done. Because again, prior to this, Jesus was on site with the miracles and they happened. But now, this is a different level of faith because it's a more difficult problem. The simple prayers that he answered before for simple problems have now built, I have a resume that's built, a spiritual resume that's built of what Christ has done in my life. And so, Typically on a person's resume, you look for advances in responsibility, right? So hopefully you're not at the same level today as you were 10 years ago.
that either you have new skill sets, you have new possibilities, or you have new responsibilities. So when we are in Christ, what happens is, when we build our spiritual resume, he answered this prayer when I was desperate. Then he answered this prayer when I was really desperate. Then he answered this prayer when I was really, really desperate. And now he's answering this prayer because I don't even understand how I'm even going to make it to this level. And so it is, it is, as the songwriters say, that every round goes higher and higher in Christ. That we should not ever be at the same level three, four, five, ten, twenty years later. Our experience in Christ our dependence upon him ought to be deeper. And so he can trust us with more difficult assignments. I'll say this and then I'll go. Someone was interviewing President Obama as he was leaving office. And as he was, as he was being interviewed, they were asking him about his workload, about the problems that come to his desk, and about him being able to, to weigh in and to solve some of the problems that come on his desk. Here's what uh, President Obama said in that interview. He says, here's what I know. He says, once the problem gets to my desk, I know that there's nobody else to turn to, and I have to figure it out because before it gets to me, it's already been vetted by a whole bunch of other people who should have been able to solve it. And if they can't solve it, then they give it to me as the final resolution. But I'm saying to all of us, whatever our problems are, if it can't work out by what you can do, take it to the Lord and the Lord will work that thing out because he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything that we can ask or think or imagine because God is able. Yes, ma'am. Amen. You didn't put me here so you can't get rid of me. Amen. Sister, sister, for those of you who are watching my way of YouTube and Facebook and you, don't, you didn't hear her, I just want to repeat it, just summarize it real quick. She said that uh, there was a position that on her job that she was interested in and she applied for it about three times and they kept turning her down every time she applied. They turned her down and then the position came open again and she said, okay, I ain't applying for it, forget it. I'll encourage other people to apply for it. And as she encouraged other people to apply for it, God told her, no, okay, now you, you apply. And she's like, mm-mm. And so after she said, mm -mm. and then God began to send her confirmation through other people. And as God sent her confirmation to other people, she began to reject the other people's confirmation that she should apply. And to a loud person came, because sometimes God would speak to us in unusual ways. And a loud, bombastic person came and told her, no, you need to apply. And when she did apply, she, had, she got the position and now has been in the position for two years. And what's interesting is, she said that if she had gotten the position uh, years prior, she wouldn't have been in the same position because she would have quit. And there are times when we don't understand our timeliness 
that our timeliness doesn't necessarily always match up with God's timeliness, but when he tells us to do something, that's when we should do it because his timeliness is the best time. Amen. God bless you for that testimony. We appreciate that. So when God tells you to do something, just move and do it. And if God's not telling you to do something, don't move, don't do it. Just stay where you are until he say move. And until he say move, you just be content. As Paul says, I've learned how to be content. In other words, I know how to handle where I am because I have covering and I have protection from God no matter where I am. Amen? All right, that's it for Sunday school. Y'all good? Any other questions? Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much.